Hi everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica, I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight is a familiar face if you've been here before, one of the students that works uh, at the Planetarium, but I will let him introduce himself. Hi, uh, my name's Eli, I'm a physics uh, undergraduate student at UMD. All right, so tonight we are going to be taking you on a tour of the moons of our solar system. We did a tour of the planets uh, last month, uh, and we did stop at a few of the moons, but there's a lot of really interesting moons in our solar system and a lot of moons in general. Uh, and so we are going to do a whole show dedicated to those. Now, if you do have any questions throughout the show, you can leave them down in the um comments. Eli will be watching those for me uh, and will let me know if any of the questions come up. We will also be taking questions at the end of the show as well. All right, so we're all switched over. Uh, we've got our view here kind of looking down on the solar system from above. We can see our sun there at the very center. The outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, but you'll see the inner planets are really close to the sun, so close that we can't really see them yet. So we'll zoom on in, and then we'll start to see those inner planets of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, we are going to be starting with uh, the Earth because Mercury and Venus uh, do not actually have moons. Earth is the first planet in our solar system, if we go from the sun outward, to have a moon. And so let's go take a look at hey, Jessica, could you um, pause just for a second? We got a comment saying that there's feedback, so I'm gonna listen to the, the Facebook stream really quick. Okay, go for it. If I can hear it. I can also adjust our audio levels. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hearing anything. Okay. Well, um, if anyone is hearing problems, uh, let us know. Um, we'll keep going for now. Um, I've adjusted our audio volume a little bit, so hopefully um, that sounds a little bit better. All right. So we are now taking a nice close look at our moon here. And the view that we're seeing right now may not look that familiar, because uh, what we're actually looking at right now is the side of the moon that faces away from the Earth. Uh, and so we don't actually see this side. Very few people have seen this with their own eyes. But if we kind of spin around a little bit, we get a much more familiar view, although some of it is dark, uh, some of it is not being lit up by the sun. So let's uh, speed up time just a little bit until the moon rotates enough. Um, so we got a couple more comments. Um, one person said they're all good, but then the original person said that it says things twice, but I'm not hearing things being said twice on the stream. Um, we also got one saying that it could be a bit louder. So. Okay. I will adjust the levels back up a little bit. Yeah, I'm not hearing any double either, so I'm not sure what's going on there. No. All right. So we now have a much more familiar view of our moon here, the side that we see from here on Earth. It is all lit up by the sun, so we can really see the details on the surface. And with our moon, we can see kind of two different types of terrain. We have this lighter gray rock that covers a good portion of the surface, but then we also have this darker gray rock. Now, this lighter gray is what we call the lunar highlands. And that's because it sits at a slightly higher elevation, but the highlands are also really heavily cratered. Um, and you can get kind of a good view of it around here. You can really see lots of craters down here as well. Um, there are so many craters on the lunar highlands that it's actually said you cannot create a new crater there without destroying one that's already there, just completely saturated in these craters. 
But these darker areas are known as the lunar maria, which is, uh, maria is Latin for sea or body of water. And that comes from a time before we had telescopes. When we looked up at the moon and we saw these dark patches, they thought that it looked like a body of water. Um, once we did have telescopes and we could look up close and we saw cracks and craters and ridges, we realized it was a solid surface, but we kept the name Maria just because for historic reasons. Um, now, these Mari don't have as many craters as the highlands do. And that's actually important because the number of craters tells us information on geological activity that's happened on the surface of a world. When we see a lot of craters, that means the surface is very old and we haven't had any geologic activity to erase them. When we have a surface with fewer craters, that means it's relatively younger and there has been some geological activity. And so these darker Mari are actually old lava flows. Back when the moon was a lot younger, it was a lot hotter inside, and that lava or magma when it was beneath the surface welled up to the surface, flooded the surface, and smoothed it out, paved it over the craters that were already there, very much like we fill in potholes in the road, which is something we know pretty well uh, here in Duluth. Um, and so it smoothed out this area, and that's why we don't see as many craters. Uh, that's also why we have a darker color, because it's a different type of rock than the highlands, because it came from underneath the surface. So it's more of a basalt, just like we find around um, volcanoes, like the volcanoes in Hawaii. All right, so that's been a good close-up look at our own moon here, but let's make our way to some of the other moons in our solar system. And so our next stop is actually going to be the planet Mars. And Mars has two of its own little moons that we can see here. They're named Phobos and Deimos. There we go. And let's go look up close at Phobos. All right. Um, I forgot to mention, by the way, the program that we're using for the show tonight is called uh, Celestia, and it's actually a free program that you can download for yourself and explore the solar system and the universe. Uh, and there's a link to the page where you can download it in the uh, video description. All right, so this is little Phobos. Looks quite a bit different than our own moon. Uh, not a nice sphere, uh, really heavily cratered, kind of oddly shaped, and very, very small. Um, I like to call it a lumpy space potato because it's small and lumpy and kind of looks like a potato. Um, now, what this tells us about Phobos um, because it looks very similar to some other types of objects that we find in our solar system. And in fact, if we go take a look at Deimos, the other moon of Mars, we see that it looks pretty much the same, right? We have a small lumpy space potato rock orbiting around the planet Mars. So these objects look very similar to asteroids, which are chunks of rock that uh, orbit the sun. Most of them live in a region called the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. Because they look so much like asteroids, and because their compositions are like those of asteroids, and because Mars sits right on the edge of the asteroid belt, we think that Phobos and Deimos are captured asteroids. Um, they are these chunks of rock that were orbiting around the sun that got just a little bit too close to Mars, and Mars's gravity actually grabbed onto them and caused them to start orbiting around Mars instead of orbiting around the sun. And that is how Mars got its two moons. All right, let's make our way now out to Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. And let me just kind of zoom back out here because what we can see surrounding Jupiter is a whole bunch of lines. 
And all of these lines actually represent the orbits of a moon around Jupiter. Uh, so Jupiter, as we can see here, has lots and lots and lots of moons. Uh, the current count is at, I believe, 79 moons. Now, most of these, like um, Mars's moons, are lumpy space potatoes. Uh, they're small, either asteroids or even uh, comets that got a little bit too close to Jupiter. Jupiter's gravity grabbed onto them, and now they orbit around Jupiter. That's most of the moons. But closer in, we actually find uh, four large moons around Jupiter. Um, larger, uh, by large I mean on par with the size of our moon or even larger than our moon. These four moons are known as the Galilean moons because the astronomer Galileo is the one who discovered them. Um, and there are some really interesting properties with these Galilean moons. So we're going to start with the closest of the four, and that is the moon Io. Now Io has a fun nickname with us at the planetarium. Uh, we call it the pizza moon because, I mean, look at it. It kind of looks like a pizza, right? You got that yellow and white cheese. We got some red sauce, some black specks, which always starts an argument between me and Eli because he thinks they're olives, which I think are disgusting. Um, so I call them sausages. But you can make whatever pizza you want out of Io. Um, <laughs> Just can't. <laughs> <laughs> every time. Every time. <laughs> Um, now, what's really cool, though, about Io is these black specks that we're seeing that Eli and I argue over are actually volcanoes. Io has over 150 active volcanoes. That's way more than Earth and any other object in our solar system. It is the most volcanically active object in our solar system. And that is quite strange because Io is about the same size as our moon. And we don't see any active volcanoes on our moon, let alone hundreds of them. So how is it possible that something the size of our moon can be so active when ours isn't? And the answer comes down to, well, Jupiter. Um, what's happening is we have Jupiter on one side of Io that's kind of tugging Io towards it. And then we have all of the other moons on the other side tugging Io the other way. And so Io is caught in this tug of war being pulled back and forth, back and forth, causing it to get stretched out and then released and stretched and released. And that causes a lot of friction. All of the rocks inside of Io rub against each other. And just like when you rub your hands on a cold day, it causes the rocks to heat up. And that heat has to escape somehow, and it escapes through volcanoes. And that's why Io is so incredibly volcanically active, because of this massive tug of war it's called in between Jupiter and the other moons. Um, now, this yellow color uh, actually comes from a whole lot of sulfur that is all over the surface that's deposited by these constant active eruptions from these volcanoes. Uh, so if we stick with our pizza analogy, I guess this would have to be like a rotten egg pizza, which definitely makes it sound a whole lot less appetizing. All right, let's make our way to the next Galilean moon, and that is the moon Europa. Now, since Io was our land of volcanoes, Europa is our land of ice. When we look at it, we see the surface is covered in a layer of ice. Um, that ice, it has these cracks all across it, uh, which kind of looks like there's been someone maybe ice skating across it. Um, but what those cracks actually tell us is that like Io, Europa is also caught in a tug of war between Jupiter and the other moons. And that's caused the surface to crack as it's been kind of stretched and released during this tug of war. Um, and it turns out that while Europa isn't in as strong of a tug of war struggle as Io, there does seem to be enough heat generated to melt some of that ice underneath the surface. Uh, 
And so we believe underneath this icy surface actually lies an ocean of liquid water, which is kind of crazy um, because this is somewhere other than Earth where liquid water exists. And based off of our estimates, we actually think there's more liquid water on Europa than there is on Earth. Uh, we think that there could be up to twice as much liquid water as we have here on Earth. And that has made astronomers and scientists incredibly excited because one of the things that we think life absolutely has to have to develop is liquid water. And here we have a world with a huge amount of it, which means you could have the potential for life to have developed in this subsurface ocean of Europa. Um, and because of that, uh, NASA and other space agencies are actually working on future missions to go to Europa and explore that ocean. Now, it's going to take a lot to do this, um, not just the complexity of getting to the moon, landing on the moon. We also then have to drill through that ice layer, which is like 10 kilometers thick. Um, or melt our way through it and then explore that ocean below. But we also have to make sure that whatever we send does not have any single cellular trace of any type of life because that would contaminate the world and we don't want to do that. Um, so actively working on this, I'm definitely hoping it happens in my lifetime because I would love to find some little alien fish uh, underneath this uh, icy surface, and it would be really cool to find. All right, so Jupiter has uh, two more large moons, two more Galilean moons. The next is the moon Ganymede. Ganymede is actually the largest moon in the solar system. It is not only larger than uh, our moon, it's actually larger than the planet Mercury, and about 75% the size of the planet Mars. This is a very, very large moon. Um, and we can see that its surface is pretty interesting. We have some lighter areas. We can see a lot of lighter kind of pockmark areas where it's been hit. We also see some darker areas. And if we zoom on in, uh, we can see that some of these areas have uh, these kind of grooves on them, which is interesting. Now, Ganymede does not seem to be very active like Io, um, but it is like Io and Europa also caught in this kind of tug of war. And so we think that's where some of these cracks and grooves on the surface come from, just a much milder version of that tug of war with Jupiter since it's further out than the other two moons. Um, and Ganymede may also have an ocean um, of liquid water underneath its icy surface. Um, we're a little bit less certain about that. Um, and it would definitely be even harder to explore because it's much deeper underneath a deeper layer of ice. Um, but we're starting to see uh, with these two moons that maybe subsurface oceans could be kind of common. Um, all right, and then our last of the Galilean moons is the, as much as I love it, the least interesting of the four. And this is little Callisto. Um, now, Callisto is not as interesting. Uh, you can see here from its surface, um, doesn't look too much. Uh, we just see surface absolutely covered in craters. Um, and that's because it's not caught in this tug of war like the other three Galilean moons. So really, this is just a big ball of rock and ice that hasn't really changed much since it first formed around Jupiter. All right, well, those are the four Galilean moons around Jupiter. Now, as I said, the rest of the moons are mostly those lumpy space potatoes. Um, so we're actually going to now make our way over to the next planet, Saturn. And we can see as we approach Saturn, and I'll head back out a little bit, Saturn is also surrounded by a lot of moons. Um, in fact, Saturn is the reigning king of the moons uh, because it has 82, more than Jupiter. 
But like Jupiter, most of these moons are lumpy space potatoes. Um, so asteroids are comets that got too close and got captured into orbit. But Saturn does have several really interesting larger moons as well. Uh, the largest of these moons is the moon Titan. Titan is uh, the largest moon of Saturn, but it's also the second largest moon in our solar system, being just behind Ganymede. Um, so it is also larger than the planet Mercury. And Titan has some really interesting features. You can see here that Titan looks kind of fuzzy, kind of hazy. And that's because Titan actually has a thick atmosphere. It is the only moon in our solar system to have a thick atmosphere. And in fact, its atmosphere is thicker than Earth's. Um, and so there was a lot of mystery behind this moon because we can't see through that thick clouds of the atmosphere uh, down to the surface. So it wasn't until the Cassini spacecraft got to Saturn that it used infrared and radar imaging to peer through the clouds and show us the surface. It also sent uh, a little lander named Huygens that descended through the atmosphere and landed on the surface and sent us back pictures and data for, I think it survived for about 30 minutes. I, Eli, I don't know if you remember from class, but I'm blanking on the exact time frame. It wasn't very long. It no, was it was very I, cold. Um, I, I can look it up really quick. Yeah, it, it didn't last long before it froze because we're very, very, very cold out here. Um, so with planetary magic, I can get rid of the atmosphere so that we can see what the surface of the moon looks like. And we see some really interesting terrain. We've got some kind of dark, kind of higher terrain areas. Um, we've got some areas that are a little bit hard to see that you can see right around here where it kind of looks like it might be a drainage network. Oh, Huygens lasted over two hours. Oh, was it really that long? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, there you go, over two hours. Yeah, actually two and a half. Very cool. Um, so what's interesting about this world uh, is we're starting to see kind of some evidence here of maybe some flowing liquid. Now, this cannot be liquid water because it is far too cold for there to be liquid water on the surface. But based off of the temperatures and the pressures created by this thick atmosphere around this moon, we think that there could, or, or that methane could exist as a liquid on the surface. And so Titan could have a precipitation cycle like Earth, but instead of it being with water, it's with methane. And so we would have methane clouds that rain, methane rain that collect on the surface and methane lakes and rivers and stuff. Um, but when Huygens landed and took images, it didn't actually see any standing methane uh, liquid on the surface. But then when Cassini started taking images of the polar regions, it actually found lakes of liquid methane around the north and south pole of Titan. Some of these lakes were quite large on par with the size of the Great Lakes. Um, and so this was really exciting because not only now is Titan special because it's the only moon to have a thick atmosphere, it is the only other world in our solar system that has liquid on its surface. Yes, it's liquid methane and not liquid water, but it still has a liquid, which is crazy and cool and leads to the possibility of maybe, maybe some form of life could develop that depends on liquid methane instead of liquid water. I don't know. We don't know, um, but that's one of the reasons that we are excited about still studying this moon, and we actually have a new mission that's heading there um, named Dragonfly, which is a quadcopter, uh, because there's an atmosphere you can fly through it, uh, and so it's going to fly around the surface, which is going to allow it to cover a much larger area um, than Huygens was able to with it just being a lander. Um, so I'm very excited for, for Dragonfly to uh, get there. I don't think it's launched yet, but it should be launching soon. And then it'll take probably seven, eight years to get out to Saturn. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be cool. All right. Um, a couple of the other really interesting moons around Saturn. 
we have this tiny moon named Enceladus. Now, Enceladus looks a lot like um, Europa. We see a surface that is covered in ice. We also see a lot of cracks on that surface. But what we found really interesting is down near, nope, it's over here, down near the South Pole, there are these cracks where we've actually seen plumes ejected from these cracks, like um, jets uh, or geysers, that's a better word, that are shooting out um, water and water, water, water vapor and water crystals. And so that tells us that underneath this icy crust of Enceladus lies a ocean of liquid water. So it's very much like Jupiter's moon Europa, um, and another really interesting place to possibly look for life that may have developed in a subsurface ocean. And another kind of check in the uh, subsurface oceans seem to be pretty common in these uh, outer or in these moons of the outer planets. Um, now, one of our kind of favorites to show uh, doesn't have a whole lot going for it, but it has a fun nickname. Uh, and this is the moon Mimas. So if we take a look at Mimas, it doesn't look too very interesting, but we can see that there is a really, really big impact crater here. And because of the size and location of the impact crater, it looks an awful lot like the Death Star from Star Wars. Uh, and so this moon has been nicknamed the Death Star Moon because of its resemblance. Um, but fun fact, this moon was actually found after the first Star Wars movie came out. So it's a complete coincidence that they look similar, but definitely a fun one to kind of take a look at. Um, and then one of my other favorite, let me find it on my list. There we go. One of my other favorite moons of Saturn is the moon Iapetus. And I really like this one because you can see here that it's very two-toned, right? We have one side that appears to be a much lighter color and the other side appears to be much, much darker. So it's got this like very different halves to the moon, one very light, one very dark. Um, and we think what's happening here is this dark side is always the leading side of the moon as it orbits around Saturn. And we think that it's collecting particles from a near, nearby moon named Phoebe um, that's been knocked off just by constant impacts hitting Phoebe, knocks some particles free. And then Iapetus is kind of picking those up as it orbits around Saturn. And because this is always the leading side, all of the particles it picks up collects on this side. Phoebe is a much darker colored moon. And so we think that's what's happening here. Um, it's just a really cool, interesting moon that I like looking at. All right, well, we are just about out of time and we have two planets left to go see. So let's go take a look at the planet Uranus. Now you'll see that we don't have uh, as many moons here around the planet uh, as we did around Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Uranus has about, I believe it's 27 moons, and almost all of them are lumpy space potatoes, um, these being lumps of ice rather than lumps of rock because we are so far away from the sun and it's so cold out here. Um, but one of the more interesting moons is this little moon named Miranda. And this is interesting because this moon is actually very small. I mean, smaller than our moon and one of the smaller moons around Uranus. But it seems to have this really interesting kind of geology to it. We can see the rocks have kind of been twisted or turned or distorted in some way. And for a long time, we didn't really understand uh, how this weird surface geology um, or geography formed. And we're still not 100% sure. Um, one of the leading hypotheses suggests that there's been a lot of motion 
underneath the surface that's kind of caused pieces of the crust to kind of break apart and turn and pivot and and that could create this shape and um, distortions that we're seeing. Um, but there's still a lot that we don't understand. And part of the problem is we've only had one spacecraft that flew past Uranus and Neptune, and that was Voyager 2 back in the late 1980s. That is the only up-close information we've gotten. And so there is still a lot we don't understand about uh, the planets and the moons around them. Uh, and so if we go head over to Neptune real quick, we'll see it also has very few moons. Uh, it has, I believe, 14, 14 or 17. Um, and just like with Uranus, um, most of these are small chunks of ice that were captured. Um, but Neptune does have one larger moon that is quite interesting, and that is the moon Triton. Now, what's strange about Triton is it actually orbits Neptune in the opposite direction that Neptune rotates. And that may not seem significant, but when we look at all of the other large moons around the planets, they all rotate and or they all orbit the planet in the same direction that the planet rotates and the same direction that the planet orbits around the sun. And this all comes down to just how the moons and planets formed. So the fact that Triton doesn't actually tells us that Triton is probably a captured object and would be the largest moon to have been captured rather than to have formed around the planet. So Neptune, or sorry, uh, Triton was actually probably a Kuiper Belt object, um, which is these icy objects that live out past Neptune. Uh, Pluto, for example, is a Kuiper Belt object. And um, somehow it ended up getting captured by Neptune. We're still not quite sure how it happened because this is a large moon that would um, take a very special kind of event for this to work. Um, but uh, the leading idea is that Triton may have actually been part of a binary system. So we had two objects that orbit around each other. Um, and as they got kind of approached Neptune, um, Neptune gave energy to one of the objects, which caused it to move further and further out. And in return, the second object, which would have been Triton, lost energy, which caused it to move closer and closer to Neptune. And so in that process, one of the objects would have been flung away, while the other would have been captured. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but that's how we think it might have happened. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's the really interesting moon of Triton, the largest captured moon in our solar system. All right, um, that is the last of our moons in the solar system. I only went a little bit over time there, uh, but as I said, there's a lot of moons here and a lot of really cool things to look at and talk about. Um, so, uh, Eli, did we end up with any questions? Um, no questions, a uh, bunch of comments, but no, no questions. All right, well, if you do have any questions for us, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments. Um, and while we wait and see, uh, if you do have any questions that come in, let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up on Monday. So Monday is uh, a pretty special day. We've got a lot going on. The first is the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn where they're going to be so close together that to your unaided eye, they're going to look like a single bright point of light. So if you can get outside just after sunset, look to the southwest, you'll be able to see this. Um, and we will be hosting a telescope stream um, of the event um, at 5.30 that day until it sets, which will probably be about six, um, weather permitting, of course. And then, Afterwards, because Monday is also the winter solstice, 
uh, we will be hosting a special winter solstice stream where we'll be joined by uh, Bob King, also known as Astro Bob, uh, and Jim Rock, uh, who are going to give us some um, interesting looks at what this uh, event means, what the winter solstice is, um, and some kind of perspectives from uh, uh, other cultures as well. Um, so yeah, that's what we have coming up on Monday. And then after that, we will be taking a little bit of a break. Um, the planetarium staff will be taking the rest of December off um, after all of the hard work that uh, my students have been doing to kind of keep these streams going since we had to move online and close our doors back in March. Um, but we will be back with our regular programs uh, the first week of January. And we'll be back. Regular remote programs. Regular yes, regular remote, remote programs. programs. Thank you. Regular live stream programs. Yeah. On Wednesdays and Saturdays. Um, and we've been working on some new stuff too. So we're excited. Um, got some new fun things to show you guys in the new year. Um, all right. Did we end up with any questions? We got one. Why does Earth only have one moon? Ooh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So part of the answer is uh, it's a small planet. It doesn't have uh, as much gravity as, say, Jupiter or Saturn or Uranus and Neptune. So it's not as easy for it to capture objects. Um, in fact, our moon is not captured. We actually think it formed because something about the size of Mars smacked into the Earth really early on, blasted out a lot of debris, and that debris collected into our moon. Um, so really, it's kind of more of a surprise that we have a moon at all yeah. um, than, than having a lot. Um, so, yeah. It also just isn't as much available space rock flying around here as there is out there. Right. We've got the asteroid belt on either side of Mars and Jupiter, which is a lot of sources for some possible moons there. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the strong gravity of those outer planets mean it's a lot easier to capture objects that come close to it. Right. Yeah. Um, we just got one more. Did Galileo name the moons he discovered? I don't remember. I think he did. I'm pretty sure. I think he did, he did too. I know that they are named after um, Zeus's lovers, since yeah. Jupiter is the uh, Roman equivalent to the Greek god Zeus. Mm -hmm. um, and so the four moons are named after four of his lovers. Um, I th um, and no, it actually doesn't look like Galileo did. It looks like Galileo had like a different system. Okay. Um, he originally called them... Medician planets after the Medici, Medician planets after the Medici family, um, and right. referred to the individual moons numerically as Medici one, Medici two. Yeah, yeah. I did not know that, or at least I'd forgotten it if I did not. I yeah, I think I was like it's a fact that I remember now hearing, but I definitely didn't remember it. I also don't know what the Medician family is. I'm gonna say it was like a prominent Italian family, so it's very much okay. like um, naming Uranus after King George. Right. Um, you name it after the important family so that they like you and give you money. Yep. I, I just recently learned after, um, after Herschel did discover Uranus, um, the K King George at the time invited him to come live out like with him, like at the palace, <laughs> just so he could use his telescope. Uh -huh. Yeah, he, he really, really got in with the king. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. Sorry, I keep looking down because I'm looking at my phone yeah. for comments. They, def they definitely were paying the bills to that comment. <laughs> they were absolutely paying the bills. Yes. Telescopes are expensive and were much more so back then. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's looking like we don't have any other questions coming in. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Um, keep in, uh, just remember, uh, this two special events we've got going on Monday with the telescope stream and the winter solstice stream. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also now offering private virtual shows for you, whether it's for uh, your family, for a family event, or um, a virtual field trip for your class. Uh, you can find more information about that on our website. 
Um, and if you love what we do and are able to help support us, we are um, still selling our stellar distancing t-shirts to raise money since we have been closed since mid-March and have not been able to um, have ticket sales and things coming in. So this is just going to help us continue to do these online streams and host um, maybe a few more special events in the future, like our Stellar Saturday we did, um, Halloween event, things like that. Um, all right. Well. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Uh, and we will see you, if not on Monday, we will see you next year. Um, so bye, everyone.